Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, really good to see you. You know, I still personally have enough connections with people at Southside that I feel like I'm really connected. And then times like this, when I show up, I realize, wow, there's a lot of people I haven't seen in a long time. So it's great to see you guys. Uh, I missed you all, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, about six months ago, I completed a several-year journey preaching through First and Second Corinthians at our church. And one of the main reasons that I felt compelled to preach through 2 Corinthians was a deep personal longing to be able to spend sermon preparation time over our text today. So that's a benefit of being a pastor. You get to do stuff like that. Um, And I believe the text today, it's one of the most important texts that you'll ever encounter in the Bible. And to genuinely and deeply grasp the rich spiritual meaning of our passage, in my opinion, is to set your weak and stumbling feet upon a mighty rock of glory. I don't think I can possibly overemphasize the importance of understanding this text and being able to apply it to your life. Uh, And as I talked about it with Ken, we both agreed this would be a good message uh, to share with you all this morning. And so I know for me... In preparing to comprehend this text, God personally did the things in this text to me in a way that unleashed joy and peace in my heart in a very memorable way. And so I've been praying for you that God will do the same. And so for the sake of your soul, for the good of the church, for the purpose of your increased usefulness in the kingdom, and for the glory of God, I want to plead with you to just be as teachable, alert, and locked into the text as possible today. And in fact, I, I feel this so strongly. I want to just pray right now and ask for God to come and help us and, uh, and uh, grow in his word and see us. So let's pray. Father, we, uh, we, we love you, and we love your word, and we love your son, Jesus Christ, and we love your gospel, and we love your glory, Lord. And I thank you for the many saints here who... Um, have found you as their treasure and, and follow you. And Lord, life's really hard. And there's all kinds of difficult things everyone in the room experiences. And I just thank you so much for texts like 2 Corinthians 12. And I pray for you, Lord, or I pray to you, Lord, that you would please, by your spirit, come down, open up the text to us, and supernaturally, by your spirit, Father, write it on our heart. Make the text part of our very being, Lord. I pray it'll live inside of us. As, as your word says in Colossians 3, that'll dwell in us richly, Lord. And you know every single hurt and difficulty and trial in the room. Uh, you alone are able to minister uh, to all of those hurts and needs at all times. So I just pray that you will come down because of your mercy and grace, condescend to us, be with us, dwell among us through your word, through your gospel, in your people, minister to us, sanctify us, refine us, heal us, bless us, encourage us, rebuke us, give us life. Lord, be God to us, we pray. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our text today is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 10, and it occurs in the middle of a section wherein Paul is exposing false teachers and defending the authenticity of his apostleship from their slander. And Paul does this for the purpose of protecting and preserving the gospel as well as the faith of the saints in Corinth from the satanic assaults of heresy and sin that threatened to ruin that church. Now, in defending himself, Paul has entered into the practice of what he calls the foolish methods of boasting in outward things, which is what the false teachers regularly engaged in. And when Paul engaged in these foolish methods, what he was trying to do is defeat the false teachers and their accusations with their own methods. And so towards the end of chapter 11, Paul began to articulate his boasts of outward things that validate his ministry. However, unlike the false teachers who boast of outward things in their lives, uh, their boasts, when they do it, they do it to show everyone their strengths. When Paul boasts of outward things in his life, he does it to show and highlight his weakness. So uh, what I want you to do before we dive into the text is please look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 through 30 and let's observe Paul's foolish boasting. Verse 23, 
Are they servants of Christ? And he said, they is the, are the false apostles. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who's weak and I'm not weak? Who's made to fall and I'm not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. And so Paul boasted in defending his ministry, he boasted about the persecutions, the imprisonments, the beatings, the shipwrecks, wilderness dangers, rejection from Jews, Gentiles, and false Christians. He boasted of not having as much food and clothing as shelter as he would have liked, and he also spoke of his anxiety for the churches that could be crushing at times. So here's a question. Is that the way you would boast if false teachers were threatening your ministry to the Corinthians by attacking the validity of your apostleship? Yeah, I mean, isn't that weird? Would you boast by saying sometimes when I carry out my ministry, I don't have enough food to get full? Is that how you would boast? And I just think in this text, as well as what we'll see today, there is so much that prosperity-loving America can learn from this. I fear that many Christians in America would read Paul's description of what he went through in verses 23 through 30, and they would conclude, God's not with Paul. And they'd encourage him to quit. They'd say, you know, Paul, if God were in this, don't you think you'd have enough food to get full and enough clothing to be comfortable? Don't you think, Paul, if God was really with you and what you say is your calling, don't you think that instead of having all these beatings and imprisonments, you might see better results? I mean, come on, Paul. God even wrecked your ship three times as you were seeking to fulfill your ministry. Paul, don't you think God's trying to show you that you're missing your calling? I mean, when are you going to listen, Paul? Could you hear somebody saying that to Paul? I could. And the question I think we need to ask ourselves starting off is, is that how you would talk to Paul? And if so, I want to love you with this. You're at a step with authentic, cross-centered gospel ministry. And I want you to let this text renew your mind. So after boasting of his weakness in verses 23 through 29, in verse 30, Paul said that all of these outward things that he boasted about, they highlight his weakness. I'll read it again, verse 30. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. So boasting in his weakness is the key summary statement here in verse 30, and it's very important that you keep this in your mind as we move forward in our message, because we're going to refer back to this. And so this morning, our main text will cover false, uh, Paul's final boast. There, weakness, there you go. Uh, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 10. So please turn your Bibles there, and we will begin our journey through this passage. 2 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 1 through 10. All right, let's begin in verse 1. Paul says, I must go on boasting, though there's nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. So right there in that verse, Paul tells us in the beginning of this verse that what he's about to say is a continuation of his boast from chapter 11 which we've already seen our boasts about his weakness. And at first glance, it looks like Paul's now going to boast about his strengths. As we see in the second part of verse 1, Paul tells us that he's specifically going to boast of visions and revelations from the Lord. Talk about an incredible boast. 
Authentic visions and revelations from God, they are very rare, and they are privileged experiences that most people never have. Surely, these are the type of things that people who want to vindicate themselves as being super spiritual would love to hang their hats on. In fact, this kind of boast seems exactly like what the false teachers would do. And this boast is, it appears to be a stark contrast from the things Paul boasts about in chapter 11. But what we're going to see as we go through all the text is we're going to see by the time Paul is done in chapter 12, just as we saw him do in chapter 11, we'll see Paul's great wisdom in exposing his opponents through a boast that they would make. And also, just as in chapter 11, we're going to see that by the end of boasting in visions and revelations, Paul again will highlight his own personal weakness. So let's continue on here in verse 2. Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. So Paul begins his boast about himself by referring to himself in the third person. I'm going to comment more on this in verses 5 through 6. But for now, let's just note that he is referring to himself in the third person. And he does so, he calls himself this man who is in Christ and describes himself as one caught up by God into the third heaven. Now, what's the third heaven? I personally believe the Bible makes reference to three different spheres and calls them all heaven. Now, in trying to honor the time today, I cut this part short, and I'll give you scripture references afterwards if you're interested uh, in seeing why I believe what I'm about to say. But for now, let's just suffice it to say, for time's sake, that the first heaven is the sky. The second heaven is the realm of the stars and the moon and the sun, and the third heaven is God's very throne room and dwelling place. So when Paul says he was caught up to the third heaven, he's declaring that he was caught up to the very dwelling place and throne of God himself. This was an amazing experience for Paul. So much so that he doesn't even know if he was in the body or out of the body when this happened. And if, you, if we look at the next verse, of verse 3, Paul gives a, a further elaboration on this experience. Look at verse 3. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. So verse 3 is almost the exact same description as verse 2, except the description of being caught up to the third heaven gives way to a description of being caught up to paradise. Now, I don't think uh, paradise is a different place than the third heaven. Rather, I think paradise is another way to express the same reality. Being in the third heaven or being in the dwelling place of God, that is paradise. Paradise is a common description of heaven in the word of God. Jesus told the thief on the cross in Luke 23, 43, Today you will be with me in paradise. In Revelation 2, 7, uh, Jesus promised the church in Ephesus, to the one who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So what makes heaven a paradise is the wonderful truth that God's there and God dwells with his people. And when we think of earthly paradise, beautiful scenery pops into our head. It stirs our heart and makes us long for that place. But heavenly paradise is is different because it's more glorious. The paradisical reality of heaven is that God fills it and he is and he fills it thoroughly and his glory is tangibly known and felt and experienced in a marvelous way so that every place you turn your head in heaven there is the paradisical wonderful glorious reality of the living God that you take in in all ways. And Paul was caught up into the dwelling of God that was a paradise to his soul. Let's keep moving through the text here. Verse 4. Speaking of this man, Paul says, And he heard things that cannot be told, which may not be uttered, which man may not utter. 
So Paul was in the dwelling of God, which was paradise itself. And in this place, the things he heard came with such glory and such wonder that he can't even repeat what he heard. He says it in the text. Man may not utter these things. What what, what does that mean? Why not? I think there are possibly two explanations why he couldn't repeat what he heard. The first one is, how do you describe heavenly things with earthly words? I mean, these glories are otherworldly. You ever feel, when you read Revelation and the Apostle John is trying to articulate heavenly glories, you ever sense his struggle? Where he's like, oh, it's like this, like sea of glass. It's like, I mean, how do you capture in earthly human language the glory of heavenly realities? And so I think it's possible one of the reasons man may not utter what Paul saw is it's just, it's hard to put it into earthly words. Now, the other option of what this may mean is that when, God, when Paul says uh, the, he saw these heavenly glories that man may not utter and he heard these things, it might also mean that God commanded Paul not to utter them. God is not pleased to reveal all of the glory in heaven except what's in the word of God. And we're simply going to have to trust him in waiting to find out what it's like. And it's possible that he didn't want Paul disclosing certain heavenly glories that he was allowed to see. So, how amazing do you think the third heaven visit for Paul was? I mean, who can truthfully claim such a thing? And right here, this is Paul's boast. And so far, this is a dangerous boast. And it's very different from the boast of chapter 11. It's dangerous because hearing this, it would be so easy for Corinth to restart the I follow Paul, I follow Apollos divisions and factions that were occurring that you can read about in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 4. Yeah, if they hear, if you're an I follow Paul guy and you hear Paul say this, you're just like, yeah, that's the dude I follow. He's been to heaven. And so this is a very dangerous boast at this point. So Paul takes great caution at this point to hedge against that in verse 5 through 6. And then after he does that, he'll transition into the real point of him boasting in visions. So let's look at verse 5 and 6. Verse 5. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. All right, now these verses are a little bit confusing, so let me try and explain them. Paul says he's not talking about himself and that he's boasting about this other man. And then he says, even though if I did want to boast about these things, he could because they've truly happened to him. But as it pertains to himself, he's only boasting of his weakness. That's what he says in the verses there. Now, the difficulty in this text is that we know he actually is talking about himself. Now, he began in verse 1 by telling the Corinth that what he was about to say as it pertains to visions and revelations from the Lord, it's connected to his continued personal boast from chapter 11. Additionally, if you look in the beginning of verse 7, he tells us that he's talking about himself again. Look, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, just stop right there. Now, Paul's the one whose conceit needs to be restrained because of these great revelations. Well, what revelations? The ones he just described in verses 2 through 4. The ones that he is ascribing to this other person. It's not really another person Paul's talking about. He's talking about himself. Now, I believe that one reason he momentarily switches from talking about himself in the first person and talking to to talking about himself in the third person is that this boasting makes him uncomfortable. He said that back in chapter 11, where all this started. Begins in verse 16. Additionally, he knows there's a real danger Corinth might boast in him for the wrong reasons. And so he says explicitly that he doesn't desire that when he said he doesn't want anyone, look at verse 6, to think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. That's so wise of Paul. 
Haven't we? What do you see in me? What do you hear from me? What's the idea behind that? What you see in a man is a man's walk, who he is before the Lord, his godliness, his character. What you hear in a man is his teaching. Paul wants to be evaluated along those lines, not, hey, look at my great spiritual experience. And haven't we all maybe done this ourselves or known somebody who wants to talk about some amazing spiritual experience they have, and they kind of use it as this shield to protect themselves from being accountable to just follow God in holiness or to, uh, to be uh, holding to sound doctrine. Like, well, hey, man, I've been to heaven. Don't question me. Haven't you seen those? Seen, I've, I've seen that stuff so much where it's like you want to hang your hat on these amazing, quote, experiences and neglect godliness and sound doctrine which is the whole purpose of the christian life and so paul's very wise in this he doesn't want corinth to do that so it, it, paul said in verse five he intends to boast of his weakness and after describing this glorious experience of being taken into heaven he uses that very incredible experience not to puff himself up as the man but to immediately transition into describing his weakness metaphorically about which he will boast. So again, this is contrary to what the false teachers would do. False teachers would glory in visions and try to promote this experience as something that highlights their strength, but not Paul. So for the rest of the message, we're going to consider the wonderful things connected to Paul's weaknesses in verses 7 through 10. So let's read verses 7 through 10. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Now, again, that's a very abrupt transition. We go from the unfathomable experience of being in the paradise of the third heaven and hearing things that are so glorious they can't even be put into words into a discussion about a painful thorn that is crushing Paul. And I think this text shows us the dual realities of the Christian life and the Christian ministry. There is the reality of heavenly glory that comes in power and it's amazing and it's precious and it's wonderful. And then there's also the reality of divinely appointed thorns that come and they cause great pain and difficulty to the recipient, but they do a priceless work in us. And so as we break down now verses 7 through 10, we're going to do so by asking some questions of these verses. And in considering the answers to these questions, hopefully we will be blessed. And so here is the first question that we're going to ask of verses 7 through 10. Question number one, what is the thorn? Now, in answering this question, we have to first realize that in our text, Paul is giving us an analogy that's very understandable. He has a thorn in the flesh or his body, and it's not a literal thorn that grows on a bush. Instead, it's a picture of a painful experience in the body that we can relate to, namely being painfully poked by a thorn. And when we relate to this bodily experience, it gives us an understanding of a spiritual reality God does in us. Have any of you ever had a thorn poking in your flesh? I know I have. And whenever... When there's a thorn that's lodged into your body, it's very painful. And while it's stuck in you, you just don't have the same strength. You move around gingerly, you favor the body part, and that body part is weakened and it's not nearly as powerful while the thorn is lodged into it. Similarly, the thorn in the flesh is a bodily analogy of a spiritual reality that communicates the truth that God gives us thorns to weaken us. And so this leads us to the definition of the thorn. The thorn is anything that causes us to become weak. Now, where do I get that from the text? I get it from multiple places. First, 
back in chapter 11, verse 23 through 29, Paul boasted about his imprisonments, persecutions, beatings, hardships, going without dangers, and his burden from the church. And he said in verse 30 that these things are boasting in his what? His weakness. Now, chapter 12 is a continuation of his boasting in, uh, in his weakness that we already saw in verse 1, where Paul said, I must go on boasting. After boasting about his visions, he says again in chapter 12, verse 5, that he'll boast of his weakness. And what's causing his weakness in the context of chapter 12? The thorn. Notice in verse 8, Paul pleads for the removal of the thorn, and Jesus denies that request by saying this, my power is made perfect in weakness. So when Jesus refuses to remove the thorn because it's the, uh, because it's the opportunity for his power to rest upon Paul and his weakness, then the obvious conclusion is that the thorn is the cause of the weakness. Finally, after concluding his teaching on the thorn, in the second half of verse 9, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. And then in verse 10, he says he's content with weaknesses. And immediately after saying that, he lists examples of thorns that weaken him. Look at it. Insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Those are exactly the types of things he was drawing attention to in chapter 11, verse 23 through 30. And uh, those things in chapter 11, we know, were boasts about his weakness. So the thorn is any difficulty in life that is painful and that weakens us. And chapter 11, verse 23 through 30, is a representative list of the types of things that are examples of the thorns that Paul has in mind. So the next question that we have to ask of verses 7 through 10 is, where does this thorn come from? And there are two answers to that text in the question, or uh, two answers to that question in the text, sorry. Uh, The first one is found in verse 7. Let's look at verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. So the thorn in the flesh that was given to Paul, Paul calls it a messenger of Satan sent to harass him. So very clearly the thorn comes from Satan, and this is very important to realize. Ironically, in this verse, the same verse twice says that this messenger of Satan, this thorn that harasses Paul, it's said to keep him from being conceited. That doesn't sound like the agenda of a satanic messenger, does it? Satan doesn't want our pride to be destroyed. He wants it to grow. So who wants our pride to be destroyed if not Satan? God does. And behind and in and through the thorny messenger of Satan is God. And God is using Satan and this thorn to accomplish his purposes. God is the Lord of the thorn. And when Paul prays for its removal, Jesus doesn't refuse him by saying, I can't, Paul, because Satan's in control of it. He doesn't say that. Instead, Jesus keeps it in Paul's life to accomplish the purposes of God. So the thorn, this is very important, the thorn is both a messenger of Satan and in a very real sense has a satanic origin. While on the other hand, the thorn is also ultimately from God and he will use the thorn for his purposes. Kind of reminds you of Job, doesn't it? So, listen... It is so important to recognize that the thorns of heartbreaking difficulties and hardships, they're both from Satan and from God. And when the thorns of life lodge into you and they overwhelm you with pain and they drown you in weakness and they threaten to undo you, you must be alert that Satan has one purpose for the thorn and God has another purpose for the thorn. Because I guarantee you, you will be tempted to believe Satan's lies about how to interpret the thorn and, uh, so that he can achieve his goals for you in your life. And what are Satan's goals? 
I don't think we could say it any better than what Jesus said in John 10.10 10, when he exposed Satan's agenda for every soul that's ever list, uh, lived. Satan comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Satan's goal through thorny hardships it's to steal your joy in the Lord. It's to steal the peace that Christ gives us. He is zealous to create despair and anxiety in us through the thorn. And when that happens, he can begin his work of trying to kill our faith. Peter tells us that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And that the way he's to be fought off is by standing firm in the faith. And so when Satan seeks to devour you, he seeks to devour your faith. And when he does that, he can kill your walk and kill your ministry. Then, having robbed you of the Lord's joy, of the Lord's peace, and having killed your faith, your walk, and your ministry, you are then primed for him to destroy your soul in this life and the next through a smothering and suffocating hopelessness. Paul said, the thorny, satanic messenger, it's sent to harass him. Or other translations say the messenger is sent to torment him. And oh, how true that is. In the middle of the thorns of persecution from people in your life whom you love. In the middle of suffering physical beatings for Christ. In the middle of sitting in jail for your faith. In the middle of opening the fridge and not finding as much food as you want for yourself or your kids. In the middle of debilitating health problems. And in the middle of carrying the painful anxiety of what's going on in the church and the lives of your dear brothers and sisters, Satan comes and he torments you with lies and accusations about what these thorns mean so that through the lies he can destroy you. He wants you to believe that the thorns and hardships in your life, it's a sign from God and God's not good and he's lied to you. He wants you to believe the thorn is a sign that God's not with you. He's left you. He wants you to believe the thorn is a sign from God that you should quit your ministry. He wants you to believe that thorns are the evidence from heaven that you're too out there and following Jesus. And that's why you're paying such a painful cost. He wants you to believe the thorns of anxiety for the churches. That's the proof that being an intimate part of the body of Christ, you know what? It's just too painful and too costly. Put your fake smile on, shake hands, and disappear. Don't plug into the body. He wants you to believe you're not really a Christian after all and that you should just give up. And the present thorn that is painfully pricking you, it's the proof from God of your illegitimacy as a Christian and especially as one who wants to minister to others or evangelize the lost. So listen to what God's trying to tell you through these thorns and quit. Stop following Christ. Stop standing for Jesus. Stop pressing on in your ministry. Stop persevering in relationships in the body. Stop trying to make your marriage and family Christ-centered. It isn't going to work and the thorns are the proof. Those are some of the thoughts Satan uses to torment us. While the thorn is piercing you. And in the middle of the excruciating pain of the presence of the thorn. When your heart and mind are flooded with these thoughts. There's crisis moments. And you have to decide. What do you believe is the purpose of the thorn? And let me ask you this. What do all of the conclusions that are drawn from all of the satanic statements I just gave you. What do they all have in common? They're all about giving up on your walk, giving up on your ministry, giving up on the body of Christ, giving up on standing for Jesus, giving up on loving people, and giving up on God. Does that sound like God to you? Of course not. But when the thorn cuts into you, if Satan's lies about the purpose of the thorns are believed and his commands are obeyed, your walk's going to be crushed, your ministry will stop, your love and faith will die, your relationships will be aborted, and your soul will be destroyed. So don't listen to Satan's sermons in the middle of being pricked by a particular thorn. 
It's not the voice of God, even if it masquerades as such. You have to know that Satan's going to come to you with lies when thorns prick you. But God, God is doing something quite different than Satan through the thorn. And God has entirely different purposes for the thorn. So let's turn our attention to that. When a man is greatly used by God as Paul was, and when a man experiences wonderful things in the Lord, like being caught up to the third heaven, one of the biggest temptations coming on the heels of those things is the growth of pride in your soul. Am I the only person here that's just like super annoyed with how easy it is to become prideful? Do you hate that? I mean, I, I, I can get become prideful about the dumbest things. It's like, I could be shooting baskets in the gym. We're gonna, I was like, I hit a couple threes. I got my Christian hip-hop move, music going. I'm like, yeah. And then I step out to NBA range and do it off the dribble a little bit. And, I, and I'm just, oh, yeah. By, by the time I'm, I'm done hitting my threes, and it's just like, and then God just grabs me in the gym. And it's like, dude, you're putting a leather ball through a metal circle. Stop. <laughs> Go in the weight room and make this dude fall out of love with sin and into love with me, and I'll be impressed. Go to a cemetery and raise the dead, and we'll have a conversation. Just, just stop. It's just annoying how prideful you can be. I, mean, I think I could be prideful about putting my socks on. I'd be like, oh, man, look at that. Got the toes right in. It was one pull. Nice and good. I didn't have to scrunch. I didn't have to pull. Yeah. I hate that. And so it's true for me and it's true for you. And if you think it's not true for you, you got even more pride than I do, which is scary. <laughs> <clears throat> so the, perp the first purpose of the thorn that God has for Paul is in verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. Now, the divine design of God is to send thorns that are so painful, so powerful, and so overwhelming that it brings a person to the end of himself and it crushes his pride. That's exactly what Paul said happened to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. In that text, Paul said he was so crushed by one of these thorns, though he didn't use that language, he was so crushed it made him want to die. And he tells us that the purpose of the trial was to cause him not to rely on himself, but on God who raises the dead. That's the exact same thing as saying God gave me a thorn in the flesh to keep me from becoming conceited. There's a great humbling power in the deep realization that you can't help yourself. You can't muster up the resources to deliver you from your despair. And if God doesn't some, if it's somehow move in you, you're not going to make it. Listen, God helps those who helps themselves. That is a lie. The truth is God crushes those who help themselves so that they can learn to live off of his help. Psalm 121 does not say, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? Oh, wait, psych, get me a mirror. Oh, yeah, I lift my eyes up to the mirror. Look at that guy. Look at my awesomeness and my great spiritual resources. That's where my help's going to come from. Psalm 121 doesn't say that. At least I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, check on that tonight and see if it got changed. It doesn't say that. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Not my awesomeness, not my resolve, not my strength, nothing from God, and that's it. God is lovingly after the destruction of our pride and conceit. He doesn't use us in our pride and arrogance. In fact, his word says this. This is 1 Peter 5, 5, James 4, 6, Proverbs 3, 40, uh, 3, 34. Here's what God says about pride. He resists the proud. He resists you. And he gives grace to the humble. And God doesn't want to resist us. He wants to give us grace. So in order to do that, he will send a pride-crushing thorn and trial into your life to cause you to stop trusting in yourself, stop admiring yourself, stop looking to your own greatness so that you will despair of self-reliance and learn the joy and freedom and power of God-reliance. This is news to our country in this day, but hopefully it's not news to you. 
God does not build your self-esteem. He doesn't do that. That is a lie. It's false teaching. God is trying to kill your self-esteem and give you a new identity in him so that you'll have a great God esteem. I mean, do you see any of this in the Bible? Isaiah sees the Lord, you know, and Isaiah 6 on the throne. And Isaiah says, I mean, I feel great about myself. He, he doesn't do that. Isaiah's like, woe is me. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. When John sees the resurrected Christ in Revelation, he doesn't say, he doesn't feel like he's awesome. He falls at his feet as though dead. He's not trying to get you to think you're awesome. He's trying to get you to think he's awesome. And he wants you to learn who you are in his son so that you have a proper identity, not the idolatrous falsehood of self-esteem. So what's the first thing God's telling you through the thorns? Humble yourself and look to me for help. Now, the next purpose of God in the sending of the thorn that we can see from this text, it's in verse 8 and 9. So let's, let's, let's read. <clears throat> Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. <clears throat> so we'll deal with Paul's prayer to remove the thorn here in a second. But for now, I want you to see the first part of Christ's answer to that prayer of removing this thorn is he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And in those words, we see another wonderful purpose of God in the thorns. Through the thorns that he refuses to remove in our lives, we learn the sufficiency of his grace. And grace is something that we can't merit from God. It's something he freely gives of his own accord to accomplish his own purposes. And we already saw that God gives it to the humble. So as the thorns are crushing our pride and harassing us and we ask God in prayer to take them away and he says no, he doesn't say no without being willing to sustain us by the sufficiency of his grace to cause us to endure the thorn in a grace of God exalting way. The thorns hurt. They cause us grief. They weaken us. God that's given to us at those times and it's sufficient and it keeps us going so no matter how big and pokey and painful the thorn is though it may be too much for us to endure on our own it's not bigger than God's grace and his grace will be sufficient for the thorn as we learn the precious lesson of living off of that sufficient grace to the glory of God as we Life with painful thorns protruding out of our sides as we learn to declare in our hearts, his grace is enough even while we're hurting. Now, the next stated purpose of God in sending thorns to his people is that he does this in order to weaken us so that in his weakness, his power can rest upon us. Let's look at the rest of Christ's response to Paul's prayer in verse 9. He says, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now that's a good reason not to answer a prayer. In response to hearing no to his prayer request and then understanding why the answer is no, Paul reacts by saying at the end of verse 9, well, therefore I'll boast all the more gladly in my weakness so that the power of Christ will rest on me. So the reason why the painful thorns come and lodge themselves in our sides is so that we'll be weakened to the point that we have no strength of our own left in order that in our weakness, the power of God may come and rest upon us. So when the crushing thorns of life come to you, whatever they may be, God's not trying to show you how strong you are. He's not wanting you to realize another one of the biggest lies that goes through Christian circles. Namely, God doesn't give you more than, than you can handle. That, that, that's not true either. And, and here's a, a question about that statement. Anyways, can, can someone explain to me how that message keeps you from becoming conceited? God won't give you more than you can handle. I mean, how, how does that help that? 
It doesn't. All that happens to someone who comes through a trial who believes that lie is that they become doubly arrogant and self-reliant. That sounds a lot like Satan, not God. And that statement's nowhere in the Bible. God has the purpose of demonstrating his power in your life, but he doesn't do it by making you the Christian version of Captain America. He doesn't make you some sort of superhero in the faith whose strengths are greatly admired. Rather, he shows you his power by sending things that completely crush you and leave you with no strength at all. So that as he shows up and he moves in the weakness of your life and the weakness of your ministry, there will be no other valid conclusion except that the explanation of the incredible power in your life and ministry is owing to the strength of God as it is dispensed in your weakness. So when Paul prayed, or when we have prayed and asked God to remove the thorn, why didn't he? Where's God in these unanswered prayers for the removal of thorns in my life? Why won't he take the thorn away? He's not saying no to that prayer if you're in that season. He's not saying no to you. It's not, anyway, let me stop. As Ken would say, this is for free. (laughs) Um, It isn't wrong To ask God to take the thorn away. There's nothing wrong with that. And so while you're praying, I mean, Paul did it. While you're praying for God to remove the thorn, and he says no, he doesn't say no because he's left you. He doesn't say no because you don't have enough faith. Anybody want to accuse Paul of that? He doesn't say no because he's not real or because he doesn't have the power to remove the thorn. He's not saying no because he wants you to give up on your marriage or your relationships in the church. He's not saying no because he wants you to quit your ministry. He's not saying no because he doesn't love you. Those are all satanic interpretations of the reason why he doesn't remove the thorns. He is not removing the thorn because through the thorn, he is destroying your pride. He is fitting you through weakness to see the power of God rest upon your life and ministry. And he's teaching you the sufficiency of his grace. That's a precious, loving, sin-destroying, God-honoring purpose that's accomplished by God through the painful and human strength-consuming thorns. So where is the love of God and the thorns of life and his refusal to remove them after countless prayers? He is mightily seen in the middle of them, loving you more than you could possibly imagine if you have eyes to see. So when relationship trials come, when financial hardships come, when verbal or physical abuse comes to you because of Christ, when you have an ongoing and intense health problem, when you have sleepless nights, when you have anxiety for the churches, And when you're hammered with trials in any other way, all of which are thorns, how do you interpret them? Do you have a satanic interpretation? Do you try to arrogantly rely on yourself? Or are you in tune with what God is doing to you in your ministry through them? Paul learned what God was doing to him, and so he learned how to embrace thorns and joyfully see them as friends. Look at verse 10. For the sake of Christ, then, I'm content with weaknesses insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So if you interpret these thorns rightly, listen, they won't do to you what you fear they will. They won't destroy your walk. They won't destroy your witness. They won't destroy your ministry. Instead, You'll learn to embrace them like Paul and see them as heavenly vessels that dispense the power of God in you and upon you uh, in your weakness. You'll see them as gifts from God to answer your prayers to crush your pride. You'll see them as guiding lights that illumine your inner man to the beautiful sufficiency of his grace. And yes, like Paul, you can learn to even be content with your weaknesses for the sake of Christ because you know they're forerunners of his grace and forerunners of his power in your life. But you've got to believe it when the thorn is poking you. There's a question. What would the difference in your joy, peace, 
love and selflessness be if you regularly had great confidence that God was doing these things to you in the thorns of your life? How would it change? You'll be a mighty person in the Lord if you, if you have this mindset. If you know the thorns, God's restraining my pride, showing me the sufficiency of his grace, and his power is coming to me, you'll be mighty in the Lord. The thorn will lodge, it'll torment you, it'll be painful, you'll say, ouch, you'll cry. But in the middle of it, in the weakness of faith, you can plant yourself in the belief that God's killing your pride, he's sustaining you with sufficient grace, and his power is going to be poured out on you in a great way. That is a very humanly weak way to live. There's nothing weaker than faith plus no human strength. But it's the mightiest way to live because at the end of our text, verse 10, Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So don't believe the soul-destroying lies that Satan tells you in the, in the thorns. He's a liar. He's just trying to kill you. He's just trying to defile the name of Christ. Instead, you have to believe God's good purposes for you through the thorn and expectantly, hopefully, peacefully, and joyfully wait for his power in you and through you. It's on its way. That's the point of the thorn. And so here's a question. Are you willing to pray to God to crush your pride and show you more deeply the sufficiency of his grace and demonstrate more vividly his power and your weakness? Has anyone ever prayed that? We have this kind of running joke at our church of careful what you pray for. You want to be humble? You want to see the power of God in your life? You want to learn the sufficiency of his grace? Okay. He'll answer the question. And the answer may not be what you expect. It's okay. God's ways are greater than our ways, right? Is that what Isaiah tells us? Even though the thorns hurt, they'll bless you more than you can possibly imagine if you'll connect to God to them. Don't lose your faith. Don't despair. God loves you. And so in closing, I'd say this. Let us lift our eyes. You want to see the proof of God's goodness and suffering? Look at the cross. There's the greatest proof of it. Let's lift our eyes to the cross of Christ, the ultimate thorn of persecution and suffering and the so-called weakness of God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, 4, Christ was crucified in weakness, but he lives by the power of God. His weakness in the crucifixion atones for our failings, grumblings, sinning, and despairing in our weakness. And unlike so many of us, he didn't sin when he had thorns in his life, but rather he continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly. And so at the cross, we find mercy and grace to help in a time of need. And the power of his resurrected life, which came upon him in the weakness of his death, it's at work in us through the weakening thorns of our lives. So take heart. God is good. He knows what he's doing in your life, even if you're perplexed. And the cross is the greatest proof of his wisdom, goodness, and love for you in, in, in hardships. So trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. And one more thing. Unbelievers. If you're not a believer... All these thorns are doing in your life, all your suffering is doing, is just drawing out every sinful impulse you have. Angry, unbelief, frustrated, worldly, discontent, violent, greedy, all that, all your thorns, draw all your sins out. And all your thorn will do to you eternally is give ample amounts of evidence of the reason why it is just to condemn you in hell before the judgment seat of Christ. So you need to look away even if you're suffering, you need to look to a God who became a man and suffered and died for your sins. And when you come to Christ, the God-man who himself suffered, you'll find meaning and purpose in life in your suffering. Otherwise, it's meaningless and it's just heightening your condemnation and giving ample proof of why God would be just to judge you. So come to him. Come to Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. 
And he knows what it's like to suffer. We don't have some ivory tower God who's never suffered before. He became a man and he stepped on the earth. He went through everything we went through and more. He took the wrath of God at the cross. He knows what it is to suffer. Just humble yourself and come to him in faith, believing he died on the cross for your sins and is sufficient to save you. God is good all the time. He's so good to us all the time. Believe it, trust it, and rejoice in it. Let's pray. Lord, in, in very difficult, painful, thorny moments in our life, I'm so and all other moments, but especially those ones, I'm so glad you're sovereign. We're so thankful that you control everything. You're the Lord of the thorn. You design thorns, you send thorns, and you accomplish good purposes through them. And Father, I just pray, help us to trust your heart while we're going through thorny things in our life. Help us to believe these promises in verses 7 through 10 of what you're doing in the thorns. And I pray in the weakness of your people, you'll unleash the power of God. I pray, God, as in, in the humility of your people, your name will be exalted. I pray, Lord, that as your people learn the sufficiency of grace, you will do a great work in this city, uh, saving sinners and conforming them to the image of Christ. And Lord, just whatever everyone's going through, I just pray through your word that you would touch their heart in a comforting healing away and that you'll give everybody joy in you, God. We love you and we thank you for your goodness to us and we pray in Jesus' name.